and I'm Claudia Hammond and I'm going to be here uh, comparing the conference for the next two days, uh, popping up. Um, I'm the presenter of All in the Mind on BBC Radio 4 and uh, Health Check and the Evidence on BBC World Service and I also write books about psychology for a, a general audience. Uh, there are some great sessions coming up um, and we are starting with a topic which is never far from any of our minds at the moment and that is of course um, the pandemic. As well as making programmes on psychology, I make programmes about global health. And um, of course, and, and hopefully, because I don't want a worse thing to happen, hopefully this is the biggest thing to happen in uh, global health during my career. Um, and I am now on my 40th or possibly 41st, I've slightly lost count, programme uh, on COVID-19. I've been making lots of programmes for the World Service and, and for Radio 4. One day in the distant future, um, there will be uh, a pub quiz, maybe in 10 years time, where there is one round that is on COVID-19. And that might be the one round where I do well in pub quizzes from the number that we've been doing, but we shall see. And I, I can't think of a, of a policy issue recently where there's actually been more mention of psychology and behavioural science. Um, not always in positive terms, but it has been mentioned a lot at the moment and does really seem to be coming to the fore as something that we should be looking to in these times, which I think is, is an interesting step forward for psychology that we're seeing what a role it does have to play in, in some really, really crucial um, issues like this. So our first uh, speaker, uh, Stephen Reicher, will be tackling the topic of the two psychologists of COVID-19 from individual vulnerability to collective. Um, Steve is the Ward Law Professor of Psychology at the University of St Andrews. You, you may well have heard of him. He is hugely influential in the field of social identity and collective behaviour. And he is advising both the Scottish and British governments on the behavioural science of the um, pandemic. And we are in for a real treat now. So please welcome uh, Professor Stephen Reicher. So, hello. Um, what I'm going to try and do today is to try and draw together uh, some issues arising out of the pandemic with the question of the overall uh, conference, which is about the future, which is about psychology in the future. And the point that I'm going to try and make is that I think that what is happening at the moment leads us to reconceptualize one of the basic questions in psychology, certainly in social psychology, which is the relationship between uh, the collective and the individual. We've always, uh, for about 150 years, and I'll explain why, have had this notion of the individual as good and rational and ordered and the collective as bad and irrational and emotional and disordered. And I think what's been happening over the last few months uh, causes us to reconceptualize uh, the collective, the relationship between the individual and the collective. And in so doing also leads us to reconceptualize the relationship between the individual uh, and the state. So that's the pitch, uh, but I'm gonna start with an apology. Normally, for something as prestigious as, as an annual conference keynote, I would have organized weeks in advance. I would have a glossy PowerPoint um, uh, for you. But these are not normal times. I have, uh, God knows why, the, the government has made many mistakes, uh, and one of them was probably involving me uh, in the advisory group. So I've become involved uh, in SPI-B, which is the Behavioural Science Advisory Group to SAGE. Uh, I've also become involved in the Scottish Advisory Group to the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, and on top of that, um, I've become involved in Independent SAGE, uh, which allows me to have, uh, if you like, an independent voice outside uh, of the system, uh, convening its Behavioural uh, Advisory Group. And the way things work is very unlike academia. Um, normally, if you ask me a question as an academic, I will say to you, well, give me a research grant, I will research it for three years, um, and then I will analyze the results, I'll write them up, so I'll give you an answer in about six years time, and policymakers look at you in the eye and say, no, we need it um, by next Tuesday. Actually, quite often, uh, this morning, um, I got an email saying the, that Nicholas Sturgeon uh, wanted some advice uh, by 12.30 today. Um, and so over the weekend for, uh, for the Scottish Advisory Group, um, uh, I was involved in uh, organising for a briefing with the Scottish Government yesterday. Um, I was drawing up a, a paper for SPI-B on research priorities and we were about to put out a report on the uh, BME issue 
for independent slaves. And all those things took up time, uh, and sadly, uh, I wasn't able to do a PowerPoint. But they do illustrate a point, and it's a point that Cloud has already made, and I think it's a fundamental point, and it's this. I have been an academic for a long time now. I've been studying uh, group processes for over 40 years. Um, and in all that time, nobody's been particularly interested. I mean, occasionally uh, the media is a little interested. Occasionally uh, government shows some interest. But on the whole, uh, I've been uh, an obscure academic beavering away on things I find fascinating and I love uh, and very happy to do. But as I say, nobody's taken much notice. But now psychology is everywhere. You look at the news and there are debates about the nature of trust, um, the nature of behavior and behavior change, um, the nature of identity and national identity and community, uh, issues that often in the past have been rather arcane academic issues are now on the headlines of the, of the news. And not only the broadsheet news, even the Daily Mail um, has been discussing these issues. It's quite remarkable. And the reason, of course, is obvious that the main, in fact, all the means we have of combating the pandemic have a central behavioral dimension. That's always been true, but it's particularly obvious in this pandemic. So, for instance, lockdown is a behavior. It only works if people actually observe lockdown. So the behavior acquires center stage. And as we uh, come out of lockdown, haltingly, um, so the alternative measures which take their place, critically involve behavior. So if you take uh, test, trace, isolate, the first question is, will people recognize and will they report their symptoms early? Unlike the traditional uh, British way of doing things, which is to show your grit and your determination by soldiering on even when you're poorly, can we change those norms so that actually showing grit and commitment is to actually get yourself tested early and to self-isolate early. When it comes to giving contacts, uh, the notion of uh, telling the authorities about who your mates are and who you've been spending time with, again, is deeply problematic, especially for certain groups, uh, for young people uh, in particular. Again, can we reconfigure that? And what about actually getting people to self-isolate um, at a time when other people are coming out of lockdown? lockdown. Uh, often uh, you're asking people who are feeling perfectly well, they're, they're, they're asymptomatic, and what is more, in uh, self-isolating, they're not doing themselves any good, because if they've got the disease, well, they've got it anyway. They're doing to, it to stop infecting others. So again, how do we change behavior? Behavior is at the core of all things. Even when we suggest it isn't, it is. So for instance, there's a debate about masks. Will masks make a difference? Masks won't make any difference at all. Wearing masks might make a difference, and therefore it's critical to ask, will people wear them? How will they wear them? Will they wear them effectively? Will they dispose of them uh, carefully? Will they touch them, uh, thereby undermining the, uh, the mask? We need to take the behavioral dimension and not just do lab studies of the impact of masks on uh, transmission of aerosols, we need to do behavioral studies about how people actually use these things. And so people are gradually realizing the centrality of psychology and the centrality of behavior. I think there's a very interesting question, for instance, that we have chief scientific officers and we have chief medical officers Will we have chief behavioral science officers in the future? Um, because the research is desperately needed. And one of the things that is clear is it's not there. And those priorities are very important. And we need to um, a direct resource. And we need to direct efforts and energies into doing uh, that. But it's all very well to talk about behavior and saying behavior is critical. Of course, the real issue is how do we understand behavior so that we can influence behavior. And here we come to the two psychologies. Let me start off with what I think is the traditional psychology. And it's a psychology which is rooted in a notion of human fragility, that human beings are beset with cognitive biases. We are incapable of dealing with complex information, with uncertainty, with probability, 
And as a consequence, um, it's very hard to explain things to people. You've got to influence despite themselves. What's more, in a crisis, when people are put under pressure, and in particular, when that happens in a collective setting, people crack, people panic. You wouldn't have a half decent Hollywood disaster film without people uh, running, uh, screaming, uh, waving their, head, uh, their hands in the air uh, and clogging up the exits and all dying horribly. So in many ways, the assumption is that human beings are fragile and that fragility leads them to overreact. And that overreaction is the problem. Uh, the overreaction turns a crisis into a tragedy. And human beings, people, the public, are the main problem in a crisis. Now, it's a point of view which I've seen repeatedly in government over the years. Uh, I've been involved uh, because of work I did on emergencies in, in uh, various committees about how people respond in uh, communities. And every time you talk about people giving people information, uh, the response from nervous civil servants and nervous politicians is, well, but people can, can people cope with that information? Won't they panic? Uh, won't they overreact? And of course, it's a congenial belief for politicians, because if people were uh, able to deal with the, uh, things themselves. If people could self-organize, then you wouldn't need government. Um, so it's not a matter of a particular stripe of government, a particular politics of government. Government in general tends to have a skeptical and paternalistic notion of the public. Uh, again, rooted in this fragility uh, perspective, rooted in this notion uh, that the main problem is the public because of our psychological weaknesses, our psychological fragilities, both um, intellectual, cognitive, and moral. And we've seen that point of view repeatedly expressed within this pandemic. We saw it right at the start with the notion of behavioral fatigue, which it seems it's quite murky as to where this notion came from. It certainly did not come from the behavioral scientists on SPY B. Uh, uh, I have talked to the people at the number 10 Behavioural Insights team, they say it didn't come from them. It seems to have been a sort of taken for granted assumption from some of the non-behavioural scientists that, well, that's what happens. We all know that people, for instance, don't take their medicines, they forget to take them or, or they tire of taking them. So this notion of behavioural fatigue that somehow that... Uh, People lack the willpower, lack the staying power, are incapable of going along with uh, stringent measures. And that was used to delay lockdown early on and was catastrophic in that sense, because that delayed lockdown, as we all know, uh, has led to many losses of lives. Um, now, the problem with that notion is, while it is quite true when you look at previous pandemics, like, for instance, H1N1, that uh, adherence declines, that at a behavioural level, yes, there is a loss of compliance. There is no evidence that is due to a psychological problem, that it's due to psychological weakness. So for instance, in H1N1, uh, the declining compliance came about because people began to believe that it wasn't um, dangerous, that there was no risk, that the problem was that of, of information and clarity about the risks. And of course, people might observe uh, lockdown, but they won't do it if it's not necessary, if it's a waste of time. So the problem, which is one of information given to people, is then translated into a notion of psychological weakness, which is used to make disastrous policy uh, decisions. Again, early on, even before lockdown, we heard a lot of talk about panic, panic buying. You can open a newspaper without uh, pictures of uh, Tesco's without any loo rolls uh, in it. It was the first time that loo rolls uh, hit the national headlines. And we were told, well, look, this is what people do, uh, that people uh, in a crisis, again, classic notion that people overreact and cause the problem. But again, when you look closely, the story changed. 
The first thing is, of course, that violation is always better a better news story than compliance. Uh, pictures of ordinary uh, shelves in Tesco's full of loo rolls isn't particularly newsworthy. Uh, pictures of people fighting over news ro uh, over uh, loo rolls is, and so you overrepresent the uh, level of non-compliance. And, um, uh, and the information that people get tells them that other people are uh, panicking. Now, given that information, if there is an important resource that is becoming scarce, it makes, it, it makes absolute sense for you yourself to go out and buy loo rolls. And therefore, the behavior which is represented as deriving from irrationality is actually a, a, a meaningful and sensible response to the information that people are actually given. And the other point to be made is that if there were empty shelves, it wasn't because lots of people were uh, stockpiling. In fact, probably only about 5% of people were doing so. But the problem is that we have derived a just-in-time delivery system, which is very fragile. And if demand increases, the system collapses. So again, systemic problems and problems of information are blamed on human psychology. Let's take another example. The next example of the claim that the problem in the pandemic is the fragility and the weakness of, 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 of the human psyche. This was the notion of covidiots, which developed early on in lockdown when we were shown pictures of people going out into parks and crowding and, and not social distancing. What fools, what idiots. Surely there must be something psychologically wrong with them. Now again, when you look more closely, a number of problems begin to emerge. The first is, yet again, um, the atypical is, becomes the headline and therefore is represented as the typical, sometimes um, disingenuously. So the media using uh, telephoto lenses, which make people look closer than they are. And if you looked at aerial photos, you began to see that actually a lot of people were distanced. But actually, the problem was this. What people were doing was what they're told they could do. We were told we could go out and exercise. If you live in an urban area, there are limited places where you can do that. There are limited parks. So in good faith, you go to the park, you find yourself in a place with lots of other people. Um, somebody takes you a, a photo of you there and calls you an idiot. But where does the problem lie? Actually, the problem lies in the lack of availability, the lack of opportunity. To, uh, uh, to go out and to distance. So what's the solution? Is it to blame human psychology and pathologize people? Or is it, as we called for many times and were completely ignored, um, uh, for making more public space available, for opening the golf courses so people could walk on those, on opening the playing fields so people could do likewise. Yet again, human fragility is blamed for problems uh, of information, and problems of opportunity. And again, if you looked at the figures of people uh, breaking lockdown, people going out of their houses, you found that poor people were six times as more likely to go out than more affluent people. Now, if you were a eugenicist, you might say, well, there, that shows you that poor people um, lack the planning, the foresight, the intellect to do what we nice middle class people do and stay in. But when you looked at motivation, the figures for motivation, there was no difference in motivation between poor and rich. The poor wanted to stay at home. The difference was that if they uh, wanted to put food on the plate, sometimes they couldn't do so. And so they had to go out and work again, yet again. And you're beginning to see the pattern. Yet again, we blame on human fragility. We blame on the failures of the human psyche, things that are failures of government, of policy and failures uh, of providing opportunity. And now, most recently, over the last week, we've seen all the information uh, about Bournemouth, now about Leicester. And again, we are told, look at all these idiots. Look at all these fools. Look at all these bad people. And once again, all the same factors are involved. If you looked at aerial pictures, of Bournemouth Beach, you saw that actually most people were distancing, not all, certainly not all, and certainly there were some who were cheap by jowl, but most were socially uh, distancing. But yet again, the question is, 
were they fools and were they idiots? Or was it that they were replying to the implicit messaging of a government which says, well, we can get rid of social distancing and we can reopen the pubs and we don't need to have any briefings anymore because there's no, uh, nothing to talk about. After Boris Johnson announced all those things, poor old Chris, Chris Whitty, standing by his side, pleaded with people. He said, look, don't see it as back to normal. And he was quite right. Don't see it as back to normal. We are still in the midst of a deadly pandemic. The virus hasn't gone away. The levels of infection are roughly where they were in early March, very shortly before we had to lock down. And if we ignore restrictions, then there's a very good chance we'll go back into the same situation, we wasted all our efforts and sacrifices of three months. But nonetheless, the problem was that, you know, actions are a form of messaging. And as I say, reopening the pubs um, has a huge impact. Every time people will go past a pub and look in and see people in them, not socially distanced, that will send a message of back to normal and will undermine the forms of compliance which are absolutely necessary get it to get us through this. So what did actually happen? How did people actually behave? And why did they behave that way? And what does it tell us about human psychology? Because as I say, the fragility assumptions, I think, were profoundly wrong. And they don't describe what happened. And I will argue in a few moments, I think they're not only wrong, but they're actively dangerous. See, Again, when you look at the evidence, the reality shows that compliance was remarkably high. Despite all the headlines and despite the photos and despite uh, the, the, the pa panics about panic, uh, about uh, COVID idiots and so on and so forth, the reality was that levels of compliance through lockdown were really high. That's what the survey data shows. Uh, there was a really interesting analysis by Bobby Duffy's team, King's College London, which showed um, something about 92% of people were complying. About 8% of people were resistant, but about 92% of people were complying. And it wasn't easy. Of those, about 44% were suffering. They were suffering psychologically. They were suffering uh, materially. I remember the day after the, uh, the Cummings press conference, there was a piece on Channel 4 News, which for me was em emblematic and deeply moving. And it was about uh, a black family, a single parent. Uh, the mother got the disease. She was ill. She couldn't look after, look after her children. The 11-year-old was looking after the three-year-old. And for food, they had watered down baked beans because they didn't have anything else. And yet still, still, they abided by lockdown. And the important thing to realize is people abided by lockdown, not out of individual self-interest. In fact, if it was a matter of individual self-interest, then many people, having done the cost-benefit analysis, would have gone out. If you were young and if you were healthy, um, you were unlikely to get particularly ill. And what's more, staying in was particularly onerous. I have a 16-year-old, you know, staying in is a huge pain. But people stayed in because they knew that it was not so much good for them, but good for others. They wouldn't spread the disease. They wouldn't kill others in the community. And again, the evidence showed that it wasn't so much individual self-interest or individual risk calculations that were critical. It was a sense of being part of the community. So the reality showed us that there was high levels of compliance and that that compliance endured it might be fraying now, but it endured to the end of lockdown to the extent that lockdown was far more successful than the predictions and the government was surprised. So why did it happen? Well, one reaction when uh, you see these levels of resilience is people consider it to be something exceptional and they indulge in various forms of uh, exceptionalism. So we are told uh, in the UK, this is because British people you know, we have the blitz spirit. There's something about us specifically. If you go to New York, you'll hear people talk about the New York spirit as shown in 9-11. But if you look at the literature 
on disasters and emergencies. Um, and this is work um, that I've been doing for about 15 years with my colleague, John Drury, who has done far more than I now and has made a huge impact on emergency planning. If you look at the literature, it shows that it is characteristically true that when emergencies happen, it isn't that people panic. It's not that they overreact. It's not that they run away looking after their own self-interest. They don't clog up the exit. What does happen is that people act in an orderly way. They tend to support each other. They tend to uh, uh, leave the emergency together, uh, making sure that everybody comes along with them. Okay. So these forms of solidarity and these forms of mutual support aren't exceptional. Um, they are generic in many ways. And if people die in emergencies, John just has a wonderful paper out in the British Journal of Social Psychology, uh, uh, which I had a little bit to do with, but um, it, it, it derived from his work. Um, a lovely paper which asks the question, why do people die in emergencies? Well, they die in emergencies on the whole, not through overreaction, but through underreaction. And that underreaction happens because they don't get information about the danger until it's too late and too late for them to leave. And that's the first point where we begin to see the dangers of the fragility uh, uh, perspective. Because it tells us that people will panic if you give them too much information. It leads to less information being given. And that's why people die in emergencies. The assumption of fragility stops you giving people the information they need in order um, to survive the emergency. And in many ways, precisely that notion of fragility and people wouldn't be able to cope with lockdown uh, was the argument for delaying lockdown, which killed many people. So, as I say, the fragility perspective is not only empirically problematic in not being able to account for the phenomena, and particularly these phenomena of solidarity and support and calm and helping others that happens uh, in a disaster, it actually causes further problems. So the question is, why? Why does this uh, solidarity arise? What are the psychological underpinnings of that solidarity? So let me take you back from this particular crisis to a previous uh, crisis, uh, to the London bombings in 2005. And in 2005, uh, John and I were putting on an exhibition in the uh, Royal Society uh, uh, summer exhibition. And it was about work we were doing on evacuations in an emergency. And what we'd done is that we had, uh, working with colleagues, we had devised a virtual reality simulation of a fire on the King's Cross underground. And uh, the question was, uh, how would people behave? Would people push and shove others out of the way in order to try and get out, or would they coordinate with others to try and get out? Uh, and what impact would that have on the amount of time it took for people to come out? And uh, what we were seeking to show is that when people feel part of a group with others, for instance, if they are part of a group of uh, football supporters coming to or from a game, sense of groupness leads to support and leads to coordination. Whereas if people um, lack shared identity, if, for instance, they're just shoppers or they're going to the sales where you're at odds with others, you're not, uh, you don't have solidarity with others, then they will be less efficient. Now, the irony of this is, as we sat in the Royal Society, uh, demonstrating these virtual reality simulations, the people who came along, less and less people were coming along. And we were wondering why. And gradually, there was that gradually surreal murmur through everybody in the room. We went upstairs to the televisions, and we saw the bombings that had happened that day, because it was the day of the London bombings. And we saw that there had been bombings uh, on the King's Cross underground. And it felt quite surreal, uh, the way in which uh, not art uh, was imitated by reality, uh, but science was tragically imitated by reality. But the fascinating point about those studies is, we got some results supporting our hypothesis, but actually we find it very difficult to find situations in which people didn't help each other. And the reason why was when there is an emergency that in and of itself 
creates a sense of shared identity. The fact we're all in the same boat, the fact that we all have common fate begins to make us think of others as part of a common group, that we start thinking in terms of I, uh, sorry, we stop thinking in terms of I, and we start thinking in terms of we. And the core idea of social identity theory, I'm sure most of you know this, but uh, just in case a few of you don't, the core notion of social identity theory is that the core construct, one of the core constructs in psychology, the self, it's much more complex than we normally give it credit for. We normally think of the self as something which defines me, myself, and how I'm unique compared to others. But as soon as you start thinking about the self or asking people about the selves, they will start telling you, uh, who are you? Well, perhaps they might say something about what makes them unique. I'm friendly, I've got brown hair or whatever it might be. But they'll also tell you, you know, I'm uh, English. I'm a Manchester United fan. I'm a Catholic, I'm a woman. They will tell you about their group memberships. And frequently we act in terms of our group memberships. We act in terms of we. And when we act in terms of we, our self is extended. Right? that others become literally part of my extended self. And therefore what happens to them is happening to my self. We have more empathy for them. We have more support for them. Uh, we even lose physical disgust for them. We've done a, a whole series of studies on this. So shared identity is the basis for concern for others, for support for others, for coordination with others. It both makes us more concerned with others and allows us to co-act with others in an effective way. It empowers us as a collective. That sense of shared identity is really powerful. And what we begin to see in disasters and what the literature on disasters now shows more and more, and there, there's work, um, I just said goodbye yesterday to my Chinese PhD student, was flying back to China and did a wonderful study of one of the huge earthquakes in China in 2008, showing again, not just studies in the UK, not just studies in Chile, but studies in China as well, showing that this emergence of shared identity in the disaster brings people together, gets people to support each other. And I want to just for a few minutes, look at the role of that shared identity in this pandemic and why it has been so critical, and why it is so important. The first thing again is to go to the question of adherence and return to a point that I made earlier, that if you acted in terms of individual self-interest, well, you wouldn't lock down. You certainly wouldn't self-isolate under the test and trace system, because as I say, on the whole, it's not in your interest, it's only in the interests of others. You wouldn't wear masks because masks are more about protecting others than protecting yourself. They protect you a little, they protect others more. So the behaviors we need for the common good depend upon people not acting in terms of I, they depend critically in terms of acting as we. And again, there's data to support this. So some of the work by Johnson Jackson's group at, at the LSE showed the importance of a sense of community, of we are in this together and we want to come out of this together as the critical factor which determines uh, whether people abide by lockdown or not. And as soon as people start thinking, well, we're not all in this together, or you know, the, the, you know, what's going on is uh, got nothing to do with us or excludes us, as soon as we get divisions, a sense of inequity, um, it will undermine that sense of shared identity. Now, I will come in a moment to how you, uh, how you form that sense of shared identity. Uh, but I think that it, it, we've just about held together, but now we're beginning to see things fall apart. Anyway, so the first point then is that this sense of shared identity is absolutely central to the adherence, which is the most important factor in combating uh, the pandemic. The second thing is that when you have a major crisis like this, what becomes completely clear is the state cannot cope on its own. There's simply uh, not enough um, social workers, care workers, etc., to look after everybody's needs, to help those who are self-isolating, to deliver their food, and so on and so forth. It depends upon the community itself. 
And again, one of the most remarkable aspects of this pandemic has been the absolute flowering of mutual aid. Uh, I suspect that everybody in this audience can give an example of it, of their neighbours dropping a note through saying, are you okay, can we help you, is there anything you need? Uh, being part of a street level WhatsApp group uh, where people uh, look out for each other and, 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 and see what people's needs are. Um, there have been, last time I looked, and this was a long time ago, so probably more, there were 4,100 mutual aid groups up and down the country involving more than 3 million people, quite apart from those who volunteered for the NHS and other things. We've seen a flowering of mutual aid, which has been a remarkable asset in helping people, and we need to use it more. For instance, uh, if we do ask people to self-isolate under, uh, under uh, test and trace, the critical question is what support are we going to give to those people uh, to make it uh, both possible for them to do so and to incentivize them uh, to do so and how can we draw on different levels of support support from the government in terms of giving them money support from the private sector perhaps in providing the goods that people need you know perhaps uh, providing people with the latest games perhaps their local football club giving them uh, you know signed kit whatever would incentivize people and from mutual aid in the community my point is that mutual aid has been as important as government intervention in uh, supporting people through the pandemic. And again, those forms of mutual support, and we just have a grant to study this, uh, critically uh, involves a sense of community identity. Preliminary data already shows that. Critically depends upon people acting in terms of us. Um, in many ways, I think one of the quotes of the whole pandemic was from Andrew Cuomo, uh, the governor of New York, who when people were beginning to break uh, lockdown on the basis of I've got the right to do it, it's my individual freedom, he said, look, it's not about I anymore, because what you do can kill me. It's about we. He said, get your head around the we concept. And in many ways, psychology has got the tools to get our head around the we concept and to use it. And I just want to briefly point to a third consequence of groups, uh, which uh, is in some ways unexpected, um, and is an emergent literature, which I think is one of the most interesting literatures in our whole discipline. It's the literature on the so-called social cure. It's the literature which started off from, from, from work on groups, showing that when people identify with a group and feel part of a group, feel part of a we, then they anticipate they will get support from other group members, even strangers, and that increases coping and lowers stress. Now that's been taken into the area of health, both mental and physical health, to show in a whole series of ways that when people feel part of a psychological group, it is a prophylactic against mental and physical ill health. So just one or two studies which are uh, I think particularly uh, telling. One is if you are an 80 year old who has uh, membership of social groups and good social connections, you will have the cognitive performance of the average 70 year old. But if you have poor social connections and you are socially isolated, you will have the cognitive performance of a 90 year old, 20 years worth of cognitive performance. Second thing, when you retire, if you lose two social groups, okay, you lose your work group, you might lose something associated with the work group, um, you have a 16% chance of dying within two years. But if you join two new groups and you get the social support from those groups, your chance of dying in the next two years is 0.5%. If you look at depression, one of the uh, best prophylactics against depression, and these are longitudinal studies, is membership of social groups. One social group decreases your chances of depression by about 20%, and that increases uh, with, with, with subsequent social groups. It's, it's non-linear, it tails off. But if you're a member of four or five groups, um, you are protected by about 40 or 50%. These are incredibly powerful results. Now, one of the problems, I think, uh, of this pandemic has been our use of the term social distancing. Okay. The paradox is that physical proximity has the potential to kill you. But the problem is actually uh, social distance has got the potential to kill you as well. 
if you look at the impact on health, these are, these are meta-analyses, um, you find that social isolation has a greater impact on mortality than drinking or smoking or eating a bad diet. If you ask people to rank these things, they always put social isolation at the bottom. It has the most effect. So we don't want to socially isolate people. What we want to, is to keep people physically separate, but socially together. And we've seen some really interesting examples of that, the uses of new technology. And yet again, what we see is feeling part of a group means that you have a sense of support, not only from people you know, but even strangers who are members of the group. So again, the group is not a problem. It's not something that undermines our well-being, as is often assumed. It is in many ways the greatest support. So my argument is that getting your head around the we concept, understanding the group and group psychology, it gives you an understanding that in many ways, the public brought together, resilient through not their own individual characteristics, but the fact they see each other as mutual support, that the public becomes your greatest asset. Instead of individual vulnerability, we need to understand the power of collective resilience and the importance of harnessing it. Now, given the time, and I'm aware I'm coming towards the end, I'll just make a few final points. I could, I could talk for hours, as people who know me uh, know, but I promise you, I promise you, Claudia, that I won't. Um, given this shift from seeing the public in terms of psychological fragility and as a problem in a crisis, to understanding the, uh, the public brought together in shared identity as your greatest resource, how do we nurture that sense of shared identity that emerges in the crisis? Because it's fragile can easily be disrupted. And the evidence again shows historically very often state intervention disrupts shared identity by privilege one, one group over another in a disaster. How do we nurture it? Leadership is absolutely critical. Leadership is really important in creating a sense of we, not only rhetorically, not only uh, talking to people as a group, but in practice, providing the material support that is necessary for everyone to observe lockdown. It's no good talking the talk of shared identity if the reality of experience is shut such that people have very different uh, identities. And one of the problems about coming out of lockdown and, what it makes it, uh, and why it's more difficult than being in lockdown is in lockdown, everybody is in the same situation. Uh, coming out of lockdown um, impacts on different groups in different ways and undermines that sense of shared identity. So equity is the absolutely critical issue uh, as we come out of lockdown. And I don't think we've been doing too well. And I do think that when you look at leadership, you've seen some shining examples of leadership in some countries such as New Zealand. Unfortunately, I don't think we have seen it in our own uh, country. I think they have undermined collectivity in a whole series of ways. Um, sometimes the rhetoric has been okay. And right at the start, I think the furlough schemes uh, and the support for the self-employed was really important in practically allowing people to believe they were all in the same boat. It wasn't enough, there were still gaps, but it was just about enough. But over time, I think that has begun to uh, slip, to fray. Uh, we have seen all sorts of ways in which the sense of shared identity has been undermined. Certainly shared identity between government and public undermining trust. Um, if you look at the literature on building a sense of shared identity, the procedural justice literature, it says treat people as a partner, listen to them, be open with them, be realistic with them, um, involve them in the production of policy and none of that has happened. And again, and I come back to the point about the fragility perspective being not only wrong, but pernicious. One of the problems is that if you believe that people can't cope with the information, and if you believe that people can't cope with uh, you know, the reality of hard times, and if you believe that people will misunderstand if you give them too much information, it leads you to hide that information away and be closed. It leads you to a sort of banal optimism which says everything is going to be wonderful uh, when it's not. It certainly stops you 
from involving people as partners. So the fragility perspective leads to a paternalism which critically undermines the forms of partnership which are necessary to bring together the public and the government um, in order uh, to fight this pandemic. But let me finish on a slightly brighter note. If I had to summarize what I think was going on in this pandemic, I would say that actually we have been surprised by just how positive the overall behavior of the public has been in terms of compliance, in terms of mutual help, uh, in terms of psychological resilience. I know many, many are suffering, and I certainly wouldn't want to undermine that, but still, people have shown remarkable resilience. We have shown that people are capable of, if you like, suffering for a cause, that when there is good reason to do uh, difficult things, people can do difficult things. And what's more, if in doing those things, they affirm their membership of a group, then they are particularly able to do those. And we've been doing quite a lot of, of research on the ways in which people almost embrace hard times if they affirm identity. In many ways, what we've seen is the public leading and government following. Uh, the public was demanding uh, more stringent lockdown measures before the government put in, them into place. The public was demanding the support for everyone in terms of furlough schemes and so on, and the, and, and the government came uh, behind. More recently, as we saw with Marcus Rashford, the public is demanding equity and the government is following uh, behind. In many ways, what we've seen is not the resilience perspective where you need a good, clear government to make up for the fragility of the population, we see that the resilience of the public makes up for the problems of leadership that we should have. And the implications of that for me, as I say, are profound in our understanding of psychology, profound in our understanding of the human subject. They necessitate our rejigging of our understanding of the individual collective relationship to understand the positive potential of the group. And that's always positive. Groups can do terrible things. When you go from we to we and they, of course they can be bad. I'm not trying to sell you a Pollyanna-ish view of uh, uh, groups are always good, but they have the potential. The potential if you construct and support and give information to a unified group to be a remarkably powerful resource. And so the implication for me is after 150 years of sneering at the collective, we, begin, we need to begin to reconceptualize the relationship between the individual and the group and to revalorize the group. We need to get our hands, heads around the we concept and we need to harness the power of the group. Group in many ways, it's a bit like dynamite and Alfred Nobel. Yes, it can do horribly destructive things, but equally it is at the root of construction. Um, and therefore we need to understand it so we can use it uh, positively. And the second thing is, in understanding the relationship between the individual and the collective differently, I think we need to reconceptualize our understanding of the relationship between the individual and the state. We need to get away from a paternalistic state which acts for a deficient public and we need a scaffolding state which organizes and supports and funds because it needs funding it's not a cheap option and funds the self-organization of communities that's what will get us through COVID-19 I think it's a model for our future as well and after that having gone on for too long I will stop Thank you so much, Steve. That was fantastic. There would be applause ringing out if that were possible. But there is, I can tell you, there is a lot of love for you on Slido and what you've been saying and people saying, you know, these things need to be said and, and that this is great that you're able to, to do that. We've got lots and lots of questions as well. So let me uh, start putting some of those to you. And um, uh, we're going to start with a couple that are linked, really. Uh, one saying, could a lack of compliance by the public also be due to a lack of trust in, in government and of people not believing the information, especially uh, if they've been caught out? Um, which I think might be linked to this other question. Do you think there is something called the Cummings effect, where photos of large numbers of people on beaches, perhaps uh, people think, that, well, if others break the rules and they think that's OK, then we'll do it too. Is, is the, is, has trust come into this? 
trust is critical, but I think it can be slightly more complicated. So if you look at the, 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 uh, uh, the opinion polling evidence, it showed that post Cummings, there was a catastrophic de de decline in trust for the government. It went down in a few days by about 21%. I mean, it really was like, a, like falling off, off a cliff edge. So clearly there was a sense of um, uh, the government were um, them uh, as opposed to us. And as I say, if you look at the, the, the literature on compliance with the law, some great work by Tom Tyler, work on procedural justice, it shows that compliance with the law is less to do with coercion, much more to do with the notion that the law and the authorities are done for us and the authorities are of us. You breach that and you breach compliance. However, and this is the other side of it, the interesting thing is that if people were complying because of what they were told by the government, that would be a problem. But for many people, they were complying despite uh, the government. And some of the evidence, and this was again, work by Jonathan Jackson's group at, at LSE, showed that some of the people who were most angry at Cummings uh, were actually more likely to uh, comply because he became the other and he became a counter example. So if you think of the people who were violating as us, they will undermine compliance because they give you a norm that we aren't doing this. And it's why it, it, it disturbs me. We need to be careful about not overstating the Bournemouth examples because they can uh, seem to provide descriptive norms of non-compliance, which undermines compliance. If those who aren't, compliance are, aren't complying are they, and the government has begun to be seen as they, then actually their non-compliance can increase your compliance. Yeah. So there is a huge effect trust is hugely important but it's not as straightforward as saying it will necessarily uh, undermine compliance because i say in many ways the headline story has been people have been doing it for themselves they haven't been doing it because they've been told to they've been doing it because they consider it as the right thing for themselves and their community and if the government undermines that and is seen not to act for the community it gives all the more reason why we should be doing it for ourselves having said that that's not an ideal situation and of course you want the good, strong leadership to guide us. It would be far better if people were doing the right thing with the government and not despite the government. And here's a good question. Um, somebody says, what's it like when you have to uh, say to uh, questions from the government, say one on your um, uh, advisory board and so on, what's it like when you have to say that the science isn't there perhaps to answer a particular question about behavior? I think it is really important for us to be honest and to be open about the nature of the evidence we have. And, you know, hubris destroys everything. Overstating your case destroys everything. And we destroy ourselves um, if, we, um, uh, if we overstate what we've got. At the same time, I think there is something very important about psychological knowledge which is helpful in a crisis like this. Because the big problem, of course, is, you know, the pandemic is unprecedented. And of course, we don't have direct evidence on the particular ways in which the pandemic affects behavior. We couldn't because it's new and it's different. But as psychologists, often we are interested in process. Uh, we're understanding general process and we're not trying to predict behavior we're trying to say if you want to change behavior you need to change those parameters so the principles that we have and the processes that we have can then be applied to new situations at which point you have to say to ministers you know we know for instance that if you want compliance then it helps if you give people voice and it helps if you, um, uh, if you listen to them and are seen to listen to them. It helps if there is co-creation. These are things we've been saying. Now, we don't have direct evidence from the pandemic yet because we couldn't. At the same time, these are well-worn principles which can be uh, applied. So the process knowledge of psychology in a domain where there isn't direct empirical evidence because it's new is i think a strength not a weakness but you have to be very clear about that and very honest about that and the best way of destroying your influence is to oversell yourself i absolutely agree with that but could you use say that um information about uh, psychological processes to predict i don't know when when the pubs open in England on Saturday, will they be inundated with people trying to go or will there be lots of people who stay away saying, well, I'm not going to a, a pub yet. I don't know if that's risky. Are you able to use what we know from psychology to predict that? It's such a new situation. 
Well, again, I mean, my, my answer to that would be contingent. I mean, I've certainly, I mean, personally, I think it was a mistake. To, to open things uh, at this stage. I think, um, uh, I think strategically, it would be far more sensible to drive down levels of infection uh, before we reopen, and then we can reopen with much more uh, normality, the strategy that's been adopted uh, much more in Scotland. And one of the things that concerns me uh, in England is actually there is no clear strategy. There are a series of measures, but what the strategy is, I have yet to, uh, yet to understand or yet to know. It seems uh, you know, a series of ad hoc measures driven by a whole series of influences, political influences as well as scientific influences. But in terms of your question, I would say that precisely one of the dangers, I think, is there is a lack of a clarity about the overall situation. There isn't an overall uh, mental model or social representation of the pandemic. Um, there is a general sense of relaxation. Actually, it seems to me that what, what is happening is uh, we are moving to a different phase that instead of lockdown, which is a blunt instrument, we are now developing, we should be developing, uh, the test and trace, which allows us to target where outbreaks actually happen and therefore have very targeted interventions. But the quid pro quo of changing restrictions on lockdown is actually observing other uh, restrictions even more, social distancing, hygiene, and, uh, and the TTI system. So I think the whole framework has been that of Happy Mondays. I mean, so for instance, symbolically, the fact that things are being lifted on Saturday, July the 4th, I think, I mean, this is a government which understands messaging. If it doesn't understand anything else, understands messaging. Clearly that ties into headlines about Independence Day, Freedom Day, Super Saturday, which undermines the whole general messaging. So it's not just that pubs are opening, it's being done within a broad framework of messaging and understanding, which suggests that what's happening is relaxation. Uh, to me, as I say, it's not relaxation, it's refocusing, which gives us some freedoms, but, but to keep those freedoms requires us to do other things that are instead. Uh, so I, I would argue, and then we have very little time, and I don't see it happening now, but we urgently need a national messaging, which makes absolutely clear we are in the midst of a deadly pandemic. And if we relax very quickly, we could be back where we were in late March. And let's not squander all that we did to get there. And in fact, I was involved over the weekend, one of the things I was doing over the weekend uh, was, was working with the, with the Scottish government around their messaging uh, about if we relax now, we'll simply rewind and, 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 and waste all the efforts. And actually it's wonderful messaging because it takes on board all sorts of social identity principles. It's about the group, it's about group norms, it's about canny Scots, it's about not squandering uh, you know, hard-earned uh, gains and, and so on. So it's a beautiful example of applying uh, psychological principles to the messaging to get the key messages over. And as I say, and that's not happening. Um, and there's a related question about messaging um, from somebody saying UCL's research has shown that the fraying of compliance mm. has been greatest most recently among younger people. Mm. How can this, how, how do you address that? What sort of message do you need there that particularly appeals to younger people? Okay. Well, the first thing is, I think the virus clearly kills old people more than young people by factors probably of thousands, if not millions. Okay, it's, it's a huge, huge difference. And actually, don't forget that, yes, there was non-compliance, but most young people locked down, right, um, precisely because it was good for the community, not good for themselves, it was hard for themselves. Right. So let's not demonize young people. I think there's a real danger that we, uh, you know, we take the exception, say, look, they're all like this. At the same time, Despite those sacrifices, the groups who are going to suffer most from the coming recession, not the virus, but the effects of the social effects of the recession, are young people. I think that young people face a really difficult future. And for many people, they will be beginning to think, well, no point think worth thinking about the future. I might as well enjoy myself in the present. So I think there is a huge question of generational inequity at the moment. And I think these issues of inequity, people say things like, like and also say uh, uh, BME 
uh, inequities. Oh, well, look, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we can't. Unless we address those now, unless we start answering the question right now of who will pay and who won't pay for the pandemic, that sense of inequity, that sense of fatalism, and that sense of alienation that we're beginning to see will grow and grow and grow. So I think we need, as I say, as a matter of absolute urgency to address generational inequity, and I don't see that. On top of that, I think there are a number of micro things uh, that you can do. Co-production is one of those principles that we need to work with young people to understand uh, the issues and the support that can be given and the type of messaging that will be, uh, that will be powerful. So again, um, not to demonize groups and say, oh, we, we, let, let's just have a go at them, rather involve them, treat people as partners. I always remember years ago, uh, out of some of my work on, on, on crowd behavior. The first time that the, uh, the, I think it was, the, I can't remember who said it, but somebody called Manchester United uh, fans were animals, they said. And the next game, the chant went up, we hate humans, we hate humans. Well, if you treat people as other, if you demonize them, if you don't respect them, then you will reap what you sow. So as I say, respect, involvement and addressing generational inequity. That's a massive issue. Well, we have a great final question for this session, uh, for this section of the session, which is when can Stephen Reicher take over from Boris Johnson? I won't make, I won't make you answer that one. Well, so well, we are now going to, I, so, oh, you do want to answer it. Well, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. The, 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 this pandemic is weird and things happen that I never imagined would happen in my life. So after I was critical of the Cummings affair, the Daily Mail, Daily Mail ran a poll and it asked how many people agree with Boris Johnson's handling and it was 13% and how many people agree with Stephen Reich's comments about them? it was 68% so in the Daily Mail <laughs> I beat Boris Johnson by 68% to 13% so I like to think of myself as the unofficial <laughs> there you go there you go you're, you're in <laughs> so we're going to now seamlessly move from um, this section uh, to meet the keynote, which will look very like this, actually. So um, what you are allowed to do now is to um, uh, go and have lunch or you can stay. And we have lots more questions um, for Steve here as well. Um, if you are going, please do fill in on, on Slido. There is um, a feedback uh, survey on, on what you've thought of this session. Judging from the comments, I think people have enjoyed it very much. So do fill that in. If you are leaving us now, uh, please do be back at um, uh, one fifteen, ready to start again, where we will be hearing much more about the contribution of psychology um, to the pandemic. So I will see some of you back here at, at 1.15. Uh, but anyone else, we, we have um, some more time for questions here. Um, you mentioned uh, just now, Steve, people, um, the inequality and certain you know, groups being left out and groups feeling differently. And we have actually a, you know, a question related to that, which is, do you think BAME citizens are more at risk during a pandemic due to feeling excluded from society with cultural differences and sometimes language barriers? Could that be contributing? Hmm. So right, one of the things that I was um, doing uh, till one o'clock last night was uh, uh, contributing to the Independent Sage uh, report on, on uh, BME. And, 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 and the important thing is, of course, the processes are multifactorial and they, they interlink. So um, uh, racism uh, and racial disadvantage clearly feed into a number of um, uh, socioeconomic consequences. The, uh, the jobs that people are in, um, the housing that they have, um, the, the, the type of transport uh, that they have, their access to the health system. So, so it works through those pathways and it clearly also links into biological pathways. So for instance, diet and housing uh, have huge impact on comorbidities, which affect uh, one's susceptibility to the virus. So it is clearly multifactorial. Now the thing is, and again, this is an issue of data. In some areas, we do have direct data in some areas, we have indirect data. So for instance, we know that black people are more likely uh, to be in jobs that expose them more, but we don't have the seroprevalence data to show uh, exactly uh, how that is happening. We know from a large literature 
on, uh, on, 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 on uh, various populations, that those who are in precarious situations, uh, there's a huge literature, for instance, on migrants showing that those who are in precarious situations can be exploited more and can't um, uh, contest bad working conditions because if they are, uh, they fear that they will be sacked or they'll be reported and so on. Um, so actually the real reason why working conditions are undermined is because of precarity. Uh, and, and the best way around it is to address uh, the, those precarious situations. Again, while we have that general evidence, we don't have direct evidence yet um, to show how that is playing out in this pandemic. Now, to me, that's not a reason to say, oh, well, until we've got the data, we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. It's to say, look, there's a strong prima facie case. It is probably a sign of racism that we don't have that data because black lives don't matter enough to make them uh, a, a research priority. And sometimes um, the, the metaphysic of science is, if in doubt, treat it as if it doesn't exist. The, 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 the metaphysic of politics is to say, look, if there's a chance that this is having effect, do something uh, about it. Um, but certainly, as I say, it's multifactorial and it's complex. And what is more, the social determinants and the biological determinants are utterly intertwined. Even when... So, sorry, here's an interesting question about uh, the isolated lockdown of um, uh, Leicester, for example. Mm -hmm. Somebody's saying if there are isolated lockdowns, is that likely to lead to more non-compliance because it will fracture that sense of we and us all being in it together because it's a particular place? That's a very good question. And um, early on in, in the pandemic, uh, with, with, with Clifford Stott, I wrote a paper um, which was about the possibility of social disorder. Um, which was written for Spy B. It's been published. It's in the public domain. If anybody uh, wants it, it, it it's published uh, open access in, in, in the journal Police. Um, and one of the points we made is, look, if there is a combination of a sense of inequity, uh, in other words, that we are being treated unfairly and differently, and repressive policing such that when you respond to that inequity, um, you, are, uh, you are treated harshly, those are the conditions of social disorder. Now, we've seen that in a number of countries. That's, for instance, what happened fairly early on in France. France had an incredibly repressive uh, uh, response to lockdown. If you went out, you were stopped, you were fined, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, there were riots in Paris. Um, in the UK, increasingly, I think we are having crises of inequity and the policing therefore becomes crucial. Now, at one level, I think uh, the policing has been actually rather good. Um, I'll qualify that because there are exceptions and they're really important exceptions. If you go to the College of Policing website and you look at their advice on policing during the pandemic, they draw on procedural justice theory. Uh, that's thanks to Clifford's work. They draw on psychology and they say, look, the best way to secure compliance is not through enforcement, it is through dialogue. And they have what they call the four E's. And the first three E's are engage with people, explain things to them, encourage them. If someone is violating lockdown, you engage with them, you try to explain why it's important, you try to encourage them. And only long after do you go for enforcement. And I think we've seen enough of that, for instance, we saw that in, in, in Bristol with the uh, during Black Lives Matter, um, to have protected us somewhat. However, it's not universal and there are real problems. Um, there have been problems with, for instance, um, <coughs> greater fines for being, uh, black and uh, minority ethnic people uh, than white people. Uh, we've seen a few incidents of rather harsh policing in different places. It only takes one failure of engagement um, to create, I think, a, uh, a, a crisis and create a riot. So the sensitivity of policing is going to be absolutely critical. But yes, to me, the answer to situations like Leicester, well, first of all, would be not to get into this mess in the first time, uh, place by creating messages which saying it's back back to normal. That's one thing. Um, secondly, uh, making sure that you're going to fight for equity for all sections of the population, the comments I was making about uh, uh, young people, but to work with localities. 
to spot problems early, to intervene early, and to think much more in terms of support and facilitation. So for instance, how, if there are spikes of infection, do you make sure that you have the testing stations and they're in the right places and they're near uh, the places where people are more deprived and can't travel? What about support? I mean, for me, the big missing thing in the testing system is support. Because if you ask people to lock down and actually to sacrifice themselves for the community, but they're losing out as well, then you're gonna have real problems. And to me, this is a space where we could be incredibly creative and bold, something I haven't seen much of. So for instance, we could make it a partnership between government, the public and the private sector. We could look at those groups and say, well, look, what would be something which in a sense would be the community saying to you, thank you for looking after the community? What, what are the things that you would really value and we could give to you? It might be um, that, you know, giving people, uh, you know, uh, computer software and hardware, the latest games, even games that are sort of in, in production would be an incentive. It might be the promise that in due course, you will get behind the scenes access to your favorite artist uh, um, uh, or, or for your favorite football. We could be doing really inventive things, which were asking how can we support people and how could, should we help people rather than how do we repress them? And the work which I and, and more Clifford, I've done a bit, but Clifford's done far more with policing, shows that actually with public order policing and policing more generally, if you start from the question of how can we facilitate what people want to do rather than see them as a danger and how can we clamp down on people, you do form a relationship with the public that disorder is far less likely and indeed people self-police themselves. And I think not a repressive approach, but a supportive approach. So local engagement, local conversation, local support, not central imposition, of repression on localities. That's the way forward. And when you give your advice to either, you know, the Scottish government or the um, British government, how does it work in practice? Are you given a specific question that you're then asked to answer? Or do you get to kind of say whatever you think? <laughs> um, to a large extent, it's reactive. So to a large extent, it is we are posed particular types of questions uh, urgently, uh, normally, um, and, uh, and they want a response. And we are able to be proactive to some extent, but I mean, the reason why I became involved in independent SAGE is um, on the one hand, you know, I, you know, I know I've been critical of the government, right? I've, I've been openly critical of, of the government, but they are the government and I don't want them to fail. I want them to succeed because lives depend upon it. And, you know, there are marvelous people within government. There are marvelous civil servants in all the departments working really hard. When you talk to the comms people and so on, you meet, you meet stunningly good people. So I want to feed in and I want to help as much as I can, but at the same time, it is uh, constrained by the questions they ask largely. So I also want a, if you like, a proactive uh, platform where I can say other things. So I don't see independent SAGE and SPY B as contradictory. I see them uh, as, as complementary in that sense. And, and in both spaces, the aim is to, is to give the advice and to use what knowledge uh, that I have to help you know, in, in, in creating the most positive response necessary. I mean, it's not a matter of, I told you so, or it's not a matter of saying resign. It's a matter of saying, get, let's get it right. And somebody says here, uh, do psychologists need to focus their attempts to advise decision-making as much on the media as on the government? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, I do think um, public understanding is absolutely critical. Uh, and I think messaging is absolutely critical. And one of the things that does concern me has been the role of the media in this. And I'm surprised there hasn't been more of a sort of a national dialogue about the role of the media. So for instance, we know, say around the reporting of um, uh, suicide, the press on the whole shows responsibility because if you report suicides, it can impact on suicides. Now in a similar way, <coughs> I think there has been irresponsible reporting of, of shock horror stories about non-compliance in various places, which have been overstated and which have been 
uh, atypical. So uh, I think all of us need to look to what we've done and the limitations of what we've done and what we've got wrong. I don't think it's just a matter of uh, bash the government. And I do think that the role of the media is absolutely critical. So yes, in using the media, it's important to get messages out, but it's also important to talk to the media, as I say, about their responsibility and what, after all, is a sort of a life and death national crisis. And sometimes as I say, sometimes I don't think they've shown that responsibility. They shouldn't be talking about Happy Mondays. I mean, I, I, I know they've been fed those lines, but they're doing damage by talking about Super Saturdays and, and Happy Mondays. And there's an interesting question here related to what we were talking about just now about advising the government. Do you ever feel that telling the government the truth would jeopardise your involvement in advising? Um, I mean, for me, it's, it's easier than for some others. So a number of people, for instance, that their work is very much policy oriented. I mean, I'm a, you know, a, 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 a traditional academic who does theoretical and empirical work on, on group processes. And it's what I love doing. And it's what I hope to get back to doing fairly soon. Um, so, it, you know, if the government doesn't want to talk to me, it's no great tragedy um, to me. Um, uh, so to that extent, no, I don't feel constrained in my willingness to say what, you know, what I think needs to be uh, said. I, I don't think that's because I've, you know, I'm any different from others. It's because I'm in a position where, where it's rather easy uh, for me to do so. I hope that doesn't happen um, because you know, I do feel that, that the work that we've done has got some implications and that it can help. So I'd be disappointed, um, but there's no point being in, 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 in these bodies if you're not gonna use your expertise and you're not gonna you know, say it um, as it is. And you mentioned in your talk earlier about the whole idea of behavioral fatigue and how mm. psychologists hadn't predicted that. Mm. But do you think that that has, the whole idea of that has damaged the, somebody's asking, has it damaged the public view towards psychology and behavioral science? Because there's a, there's a kind of talk going around that, oh, the psychologists got it wrong. Hmm. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is, I, I don't know, because I don't have uh, any polling evidence. So I don't think that there is any. On the other hand, I mean, uh, anecdotally, it, you know, there are, I mean, I, 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 I got into a discussion with, with, uh, with Martha Gill from, from the Times, who was saying this was behavioural science and they should stop uh, listening to behavioural uh, science. And I was trying to argue, no, this is not, you know, don't lump everything together. It's really important to understand, first of all, I mean, actually, I don't really like the term behavioural science. I don't quite know what it means and what's included and what isn't, isn't included. But um, uh, I, I guess that's not a cause I'll go to the wall for. But, but nonetheless, there are very different views indeed. And, and certainly all the people I spoke to didn't go along with the notion of behavioural fatigue. There was that letter um, sent by some 700 uh, behavioural scientists saying, we don't know where the hell uh, that's coming from. And as I say, most of our argument has been that the problems don't lie in psychology and motivation on the whole, that's been remarkably high uh, in terms of, 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 of supporting restrictions. It's been in terms of these other dimensions of information and, and opportunity. And very often we blame on psychology uh, what are problems which aren't psychological. Somebody asks here, what do you consider to be the biggest barrier towards getting the cabinet to, to listen to your advice? Is the social psychology of the cabinet as a group relevant here? <laughs> I think the politics of, of, of the cabinet. Are, I mean, the, the, there are a number of issues. Um, I mean, one is just bureaucracy and governance. So it, it's interesting comparing the, the Scottish and the UK experience. Um, you know, uh, Scotland is rather small um, and, you know, the advisory group, uh, you know, there's a single advisory group and uh, actually, and, and, uh, I mean, this does worry me greatly. I mean, I'm the only behavioral scientist on it. So they turn to me as if I know about not just everything in psychology, which plainly I don't, but, um, uh, but behavioral science more, more broadly. But on the positive side, it means there are less steps between us and the government. So we directly um, talk to government and, and uh, we become directly involved in, in, in the details. So for instance, um, uh, one of the things which really excites me is the Scottish government listened to our arguments about co-creation and wants to set up 
a process to involve all sections of the community in uh, giving input to, follow, to, to, to policy development. And, and uh, we had the first of a series of workshops on that. So there's a real concrete sense of something is happening. Or again, um, I've been involved in, in, in the nitty gritty of the messaging and how can we use general psychological principles to actually um, shape the, the advertising. And I think the advertising, you know, the We Are Scotland campaigns, I think are marvellous. And I think they really do uh, use psychological principles of, of groups and norms and so on. England is a much bigger place. So, you know, I'm on Spy B. Spy B feeds into Sage. Sage feeds into the Cabinet Office. Cabinet Office feeds into, uh, you know, the ministers who actually make the decisions. And between us and that, there are all sorts of other places where uh, voices are heard. So uh, the number 10 behavioral insights team, um, so-called nudge unit, which is more behavioral economics and psychology is feeding things in. And I mean, uh, they do take more of the sort of traditional fragility uh, view. They do um, uh, ha have a very different view. They're entirely entitled to it. Then, of course, you know, what are people like Dominic Cummings whispering into Boris Johnson's ear? I, we simply don't know. Now, I'm all for transparency. And one of the things that has kept me uh, involved in SPY-B is the fact that there was an agreement that all our papers would be published. You can find them on the website. and They wouldn't be redacted um, so that people can see everything, unless there are very clear national security implications. But there aren't very often. Um, that means that the advice we give can be seen by the public and the public can judge for themselves whether they think it's being listened to uh, or not. But I think that should be true of everyone. I would like to know all the advice that government is getting in making its decisions. I think that openness and that transparency is absolutely critical. And only if we have that information can we then begin to answer the question uh, that was asked. So it's a critical one and it makes the case for openness and transparency at all levels. So do you think that you have been able to make psychology have an impact? Are there things you see happening where you sort of think, I mean, maybe more in Scotland than in England by the sound of it, where you think, yeah, that was the, one of the things that we talked about. That's one of the things from psychological research. And now that's been put into place. There, there it made a difference. Things. Yeah, there are some examples of things which, which were done or weren't done. I mean, so for instance, again, early on, we advise strongly against a repressive approach. Um, uh, I think I think that there's an interesting question of the relationship between mandatory uh, uh, versus optional and repressive, not repressive, and people conflate those two. So, for instance. Um, uh, personally, I, be, I am more, I, I have become more in favour of wearing masks, um, both because they have some effect, but also because one of the things, I think one of the problems is that, for instance, the role of social, di of, of physical distancing, right, it was partly practical, and of course that was a very large part of it, but it also meant that in all our interactions with others, we were reminded of the fact that we are in special times. Okay. We were reminded of the fact that look, something remarkable is going on and we, and we have to adjust our behaviour. It was a message. Every interaction was a message to us. We're still in trouble, uh, trouble times. If you go from two metres to one metre, well, there are various problems. One of them is that, you know, the research on proxemics suggests that certainly in the UK, about one metre is the normal distance anyway. So by going from two watt metres to one metre, you're in effect getting rid of, uh, you know, anything special. And, and therefore you begin to interact as you would normally interact. Um, and therefore you lose that powerful um, symbolic uh, messaging. As I say, a messaging in every interaction, which far outweighs, you know, anything you can put from a, 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 a press conference or, or, or whatever. And I think it's really important um, that we retain, if you like, that, that symbolic element, something which says to us, in everything we do, we are in special times and we need to uh, abide uh, by them. So, as I say, I, I am more in favour of face masks, both because they have some effect and also because they, uh, they're a signifier of special times. And actually, they also signify I'm concerned with you. If you look at mask usage in China, it is a way of communicating a social norm of concern for, for others. 
Now, how do we get people to wear masks? Well, I'm constantly reminded of, of that old Einstein saying where he says, you know, uh, insanity is doing the same thing yet again and expecting a different outcome. So time and again, we say, please, can you do this? It has no effect. And so I do think that making it mandatory, uh, there's an argument for it. I think it is dependent, number one, on actually having masks available to give to people. I would make sure that there were free masks available on all buses, for instance, and, and, and in, uh, in shops. But that's not the same as saying you then respond with repression if people don't do it. Doesn't mean that, okay, what I'm saying is I want to come down on you with, with a big stick. I would go back to the policing and the four E's of engaging uh, encouraging, explaining, and it's much more easy to do that, and we can do it to each other once it becomes mandatory. So again, uh, I, I, I mean, for me, I think uh, uh, you know, there, there are subtle and complex arguments about about the behavioural science which need to be bound more into all these decisions. And you mentioned as well in your talk, you talked about the um, positivity of the many, many mutual aid groups um, and uh, the WhatsApp group I'm in has been, has been flashing all, all morning, I can tell you, with all sorts of things going, interesting things going on in the street. Yeah. But um, uh, somebody's asked the, the really good question of, you know, this is an excellent thing. How can you how can we preserve that going forward mm -hmm. so that, that this we sense continues, um, in, particularly in, in small communities and streets, when one day this is all over? Um, so that takes me right back to the start of my talk, because we now have a grant uh, uh, where we get, I mean, that's one of the things we're going to look at. So we are, there are various elements that we're looking at, but one which, um, uh, which John Drury is leading on is precisely that question. Um, so we'll do the research for two years. Um, we'll analyze it for a year. We'll write it up and I'll give you an answer in four years time. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it is an excellent question. <coughs> Again, I think there are uh, you know, a number of issues uh, involved. I mean, part of it is, um, you know, the, uh, you know, is internal, it's issues of organization, it's issues of, okay, making sure that there is relevance, what is, what is you know, a, a clear sense of what is gonna be done uh, next, uh, um, perhaps creating structures as well. As I say, I think uh, there's a really interesting question bound up with this question of the relationship between the individual and the state and the extent to which um, uh, the state scaffolds self-organization. The problem is, I remember years ago being asked to take part in these uh, workshops about uh, community resilience and I was wondering well why, what's going on here and then it, uh, it was obvious because it was in the middle of the austerity period that uh, social services were being cut and therefore we were, people were asked to do it for themselves. Now if self-organization is an excuse for cuts it's never going to work because to do it properly you need funding i mean for groups to work together they need resourcing they need spaces to meet they need um, access of disabled they need all sorts of things so i think the question about how the state scaffolds supports and funds community self-organization i think is, a, is an absolutely critical question going forward and is one of the things which if done well could bring positive consequences. So some of it comes from the self-organization of, uh, of those groups, uh, but some of it I think absolutely comes from rethinking uh, the state individual relationship. Well, that has been a fantastically interesting session. We are going to let everybody have lunch now. And in place of applause, Steve, you get the, the lovely news that the vast majority of people didn't go and get longer <laughs> lunch. They stayed and listened to you. So what more joy and praise could you have than that? Well, thank you. Uh, that Thanks was absolutely understand. fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, we will be convening again at um, starting at 1.15, so do be there for that. Do fill in your feedback on Slido. Thank you so much to everybody who's been watching all morning. I think this proves that conferences online are quite fun and certainly very interesting. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Steve. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Bye.